that most people are intimidated by science. They, don't, they just don't get it. They don't think they can master the details. They find the vocabulary daunting and unfamiliar. And yet, as you just heard, people will happily memorize baseball statistics and soccer statistics, and they know all about uh, Hollywood uh, intrigues and political campaigns and crime stories. But you put them next to a molecule or a proton or a cell or a distant star, and they say, no, thank you. Uh, it's just not my thing. This is also true, interestingly, of newsrooms. I worked for 23 years at CBS and ABC, a lot of that time doing economics, and those stories were always welcome. When I got to science, I've discovered science is a really hard sell in, in a newsroom um, to a ridiculous degree. I'll tell you a story. One day, somebody sent me some footage, it was underwater footage, of an octopus. And it was just wonderful. Uh, it's now famous, it, but I was the first person to get this video. And I put it in my machine, and I, I gulped. I thought, oh my god, I, this is so unusual. So I went in to see my boss, who was named uh, Peter Jennings. He was the anchor of the ABC News. And I said to him, Peter, I have the most amazing thing to show you. I, I, I want you to sit down and look at it, and it's, it lasts just two minutes, two and a half minutes, uh, at, but I think you're going to be, you have to put this on tonight. He says, no. I said, well, I said, what do you mean, no? I said, no, not tonight. I said, you have to look at it. You have to just look, please look at it, and then you can decide. No, he says, today, Saddam Hussein is missing somewhere in Baghdad. The Americans had just uh, taken over the city. Uh, Uday and his other son were out there somewhere. He says, we are going to spend the show looking for Saddam and looking for Uday and looking for the other boy, and we're not going to do anything about octopuses. Says, you haven't seen the footage. Just look at it, and then you tell me, he says, I will not. He says, you must. How can you be here, the head of the company? You, what do you mean you're not going to put it on without even looking at it? It's two minutes. He said, I don't want to look at it. I said, you want to look at it? He said, no, you don't. He said, I said, he said, if I make this story about Saddam Hussein, would you put it on tonight? And he looked and he said, okay. <laughs> now, I'm not very proud of what I'm about to show you. But you'll see if you could run. This is what I, this is unbelievably ridiculous. Finally this evening in the name of survival. Evolution has given many animals the ability to deceive their enemies and none is more dramatic than the octopus. Rich material for ABC's Robert Krulwich. After Saddam and his son stole more than a billion dollars, there's talk now that he is searching for a cosmetic surgeon to disguise himself. Well, Saddam the dictator might want to meet Saddam the octopus, because some octopuses really know how to disappear, says biologist Roger Hanlon. This is what octopuses do for a living. They disappear all the time. For example, Roger saw this bush in shallow Caribbean water, but as he moved closer, now watch the bush. Look at this. It turns into an octopus. It squirts ink and runs. That's good. This one's one of the best. We gotta see this again. Let's go backwards before it ran away to when the octopus was all puffed up to look big and scary. And now backwards and in slow motion, watch the eyes. You see how the pigment is changing back to a dark algae and rock color? And the skin, if you look, it's beginning to pucker. It becomes more rock-like. This is deliberate. So if they see the algae next to them, they can mimic the algae. Yeah, it's definitely getting lumpier all over. And this is happening. The muscle changes and the color changes. How long in real time? It takes less than a second to make any of these changes. So they can become a rock in less than a second. It's instantaneous. Huh. Gone. The octopus and its cousin, the cuttlefish, this is a cuttlefish, are simply, says Roger, the planet's masters of disguise. Nobody, watch this cuttlefish. Nobody does it better. So if plastic surgeons could figure out what the octopus does, certain people might pay considerable sums of money, especially for a quick change. I think the octopus can change its appearance as quickly as any animal on Earth. If you could turn that into plastic surgery, it'd be pretty cool. Indeed. Robert Fulwich, ABC News. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so it's, it turns out that science is the thing that you do on television after the war news, after the economics, after the politics, after the sports, after the weather, after everything. But 
Uh, while at ABC, I began working on an experimental show on public radio in America that explores very sophisticated ideas in science, working with a team of, of mostly people in their, in their 20s, uh, much younger than me. Uh, they're quite good. And to my amazement, we seem to have accidentally invented something that really works well. Uh, it has three million downloads a month. It is the, one of the top three podcasts in the United States, where the audience is mostly young and mostly into music and sports and comedy, and yet we are consistently number two or number three or number four on iTunes. It's growing much more popular all over the world, and it's about science. But we never say so. It's called Radio Lab, and we design it not for people who love science, but for people who love stories, though our stories are almost always about a science question at their core. For example, we once did a program about, um, about randomness and probability, and we were exploring the question, when something really unusual happens, very, very rare, how should you think about it? Because sometimes things are so surprising they feel like a miracle. But are they really? And I wanted you to just listen. Uh, you'll see we're going to do this. This is a CD, the Buxtons it's called. This is how we began that program. And you'll hear it's quite, it's interestingly, um, the, the voice you'll hear mostly is my partner, Jed Abumrad, whose uh, family's up from, uh, in, from Lebanon. And he and I work together most of the time. But that's, this is today with a truly remarkable story, <laughs> which begins with this girl right here. Um. Hello, I'm Laura Buxton. Laura Buxton is her name. Remember that name. I should turn my hair back. And Laura, mm -hmm. let's do this like a movie, okay? Like a movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's June 2001. Yeah. Where are we? Oh, we're in a little town in northern England called... Stoke-on-Trent. Stoke-on-Trent. Yep. Mm -hmm. And there is Laura Buxton standing in her front yard. She is 10 years old. Yeah, well, almost 10. Whatever. She's a tall girl. Pretty tall for my age. Pigtails. And in her hand... She's holding a balloon, a red balloon. You with me so far? Yeah. She has written her name on the balloon. It just said, um, please return to Laura Boxton. And then on the other side, it had my address. Mm. So there she is, standing in her front yard with her balloon. It's very windy. And she holds her balloon up to the sky, to the heavens. And I just let it go. And the wind took it. <laughs> We were laughing and joking because we just thought it would get stuck in a tree a bit further down the road somewhere. But that's not what happened. The balloon kept going. All right, now I'm looking at a map here of England, and Stoke-on-Trent is at the top, yeah. so the balloon would have had to go south, like pound, down, down, past Stratford, yeah. past Walsall, yeah. past Wolverhampton, then past Birmingham, yeah. past Kidderminster, past Worcester, yeah. past millions of people, past Chettingham, yeah. Yeah. people with different lives, different names, past Gloucester, Gloucester, <laughs> Gloucester, and all in all, the red balloon goes about 140 miles south. Exactly against the prevailing wind. Oh, really? Which is a southwesterly. Okay, so finally, when this balloon is all the way on the other side of the country, it begins to descend. Down, down, down. And of all the places it could have landed, you know, in a river, in a factory parking lot, in the sea. Instead, the balloon touches down in the yard of this girl. I live, I live in the countryside in a little village called Milton Lilbourne. Just so you're not confused, this is a different girl than the first one. They do sound the same, but they live on opposite ends of the country. The balloon got stuck in our hedge but our next door neighbor found it and he thought it was just a bit of rubbish and he collected it up so the cows wouldn't eat it because he didn't want the cows to like choke on the rubbish. And he was about to put it in the bin, like literally. And then he saw the label saying, please send back to Laura Buxton. And he was like, oh my God. Why? Why would he say, oh my God? Okay, so check this out. Uh -huh. Remember how I told you how the first girl who sent the balloon was 10? Yeah. The second girl who received it? I'm 10 years old. She's 10, okay? Okay. No, wait, there's more. <laughs> Better be Remember how I told you the first girl's name was Laura Buxton? Yeah. Well, girl number two, can you introduce yourself? Okay, um, hi, I'm Laura Buxton. <laughs> what? Girl number one. Hello, I'm Laura Buxton. Girl number two. Hello, I'm Laura Buxton. They're both Laura Buxton? Yeah. No. Yes. Both named Laura Buxton. Yes. Yeah. You heard me right. A 10-year-old girl named Laura Buxton. Let's go of a balloon. Phew. That balloon floats 140 miles and lands in the yard of another 10-year-old girl named Laura Buxton. Is this for real? Yes. 
I think it might be the strangest thing I've ever heard in my life. It's pretty weird. It's so weird, we had to get them both into a studio. Hello, New York, this is London. Can you hear me? So, like, we're going to hear Americans through these. So the show goes on, and we start talking to the girls, and then we start to talk to a statistics professor, and then to an actuary in an insurance business. And the question is, is how odd is this Laura Buxton coincidence, really? Is it miracle odd? I mean, do you have to have God to take a balloon in one place and drop it into another place and have the two people both be named Laura Buxton, and both of them have the same color hair, and both of them have a hamster, and the hamster is brown and white, and the other one's, oh, I have a hamster that's brown and white as well and so forth. Um, so, or is it in some sense predictable? And we then begin to discuss the shape of randomness. And randomness does have a shape. And the Buxton girls are involved, and one of them thinks it was a, it was a noble wind, she said, that brought one balloon to the other. And they start arguing with the statistics professors. But as you can hear, Radiolab does not have the beats or the music of an ordinary news show. We don't sound official. We don't talk only to experts. We are not experts. We are not formally trained in the sciences. We learn on the job in front of our audience, and so they learn with us, and we play. And play is extremely important to us. When you're dealing with a complex and serious subject, you, of course, can always talk about it seriously, but you don't have to. So I want to give you an example of how this works when it really works well. We were doing a story about the origins of music, and we were asking ourselves, well, where does music come from? Does it evolve out of the naturally occurring sounds of wind and rain and, and dripping and gurgling? The, you know, I always hear in Hebrew the word babakbuk. It just sounds exactly like when you turn over a bottle. You know, babakbuk, 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 babakbuk. Just, so that maybe music comes out from something like that, or, uh, or, or maybe it's borrowed from a bird song or, or the pattern of living things, or, or maybe it comes from pure pattern, from mathematics, or might, maybe it emerges from the tones of human speech. So that was our subject. And we were talking to a scientist, Diana Deutsch, who studies speech. And one of the things she does is she records human speech. She records human speech. She records human speech. She records human speech. And she loops it. She connects it together, connects it together, connects it together. So, and then she, doing this, she made an interesting discovery. So let's do that. This is a CD number three. And you're going to be listening to, I think, Jad again and uh, Diana Deutsch. I'll, I'll tell you what happened is that um, when you do post-production, as, as you know, of, of, of speech, you loop things, loop things, loop things, so that you can zero in on P's poop, poop, that sound too loud, you need to unpop, or S's that sound too sharp, and so on. So you put things on loops in order to fine-tune the way the speech sounds. So I had this particular phrase on a loop and forgot about it. What phrase was this? It's a phrase that occurs at the beginning of the CD in which I say, the sounds as they appear to you are not, not only, only different, different from those, those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. As to seem quite impossible. Now, I had sometimes behave so strangely looped. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely Sometimes behave so strangely. Just those few words. Sometimes behave so strangely. And forgot about Sometimes it. behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. So here's what happened. Diana Sometimes leaves her studio. She so closes strangely. the door, goes into the kitchen to make Sometimes some tea. All the while, this loop is whirring away in the background. As she's so sipping her tea, she thinks, Sometimes is someone so singing? Strangely. Who's singing? I heard what sounded like song in the background. She realized, wait a second. That's not singing, that's me, talking. That very phrase. So strangely. But at this point, sometimes behave so strangely. appeared to be sung rather than spoken. So strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. This is sometimes behave so strangely, right? <laughs> yeah. You still hear the words, but the, they're sung words rather than spoken words. It's weird, like, it just switches at a certain point. Three or four repetitions in. Right. It's going, it's going, and then... Pow! It becomes music. And then now, now none of us can get it out of our head. Like the whole office is like, sometimes behave so strangely. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes behave, behave so, so strangely. strangely. And you know what? If you do this demo and then you go back to the original sentence, it sounds like, you know, speech to begin with. And when you come to that very phrase 
I seem to be bursting into song. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. I have to say this can continue for months and months. It's sort of, <laughs> sort of like your brain gets altered for that particular phrase and, and, it, and it continues to sound like singing. For a very, very long time. All right, so here we have just one small indication that music is, well, it behaves very strangely. I mean, think about this. We started with some basic speech, repeated it a few times. Somewhere along the way, it leapt into song. How did it change like that? And if that's all it takes to turn something into music, then what exactly is music? Really. Sometimes this is Radio Lab. Stick around. Sometimes they behave so strangely. The, the fun of doing this is that we we. We work with people all over New York City where we work, and, and there's a high school called the, it's for the High School of Performing Arts called LaGuardia High School, and they have a choir class. So every year we call up the choir teacher and we say, can we use you all year long? And then we have these 15 and 16 year olds and we bring them science problems and we say, can you help us illustrate it? We just did one where we had, uh, we had a, a, a church choir in Harlem, and we were we had uh, we were doing we just did a show on color, and we wanted to know how many colors would a dog see in a rainbow, how many colors would a sparrow see in a rainbow, how many colors would a human being see in a rainbow, and how many colors would a mantis shrimp, that was the the tricky one, see in a rainbow. They have different eyes, and they have actually a very different ability to see. And we did the whole thing to the Hallelujah Chorus by Haydn with three church choirs. And it's, this is really fun to do. But that story you just heard is the kind where, you know, you, we don't have to embroider or teach you anything. You just listen, and you can make the discovery yourself. And you have that neat reward of remembering it a few hours later, because sometimes behave so strangely is something that just sticks in your head. And... Most important, you walk away feeling you've just learned something and it gives you a little muscle. So the next time the question of sound and speech ever comes up, you have that feeling, oh, I know about that. I have something to say. And that's our goal, is to make people walk away from our program with a sense that they've discovered something and it leaves them a little bit braver. And there are lots and lots of ways to do that. And I will talk in my talk tomorrow about some of the crazy ways we've done it. And some of them are pretty wonderful. But almost as important to us is we are also modeling a style of journalism that is not traditional at all. Traditionally, what journalism teaches is the reporter gets his or her assignment, the reporter goes out, the reporter does research, the reporter conducts interviews, the reporter learns what she has to learn, the reporter sets it down, the reporter checks it, the reporter gets it right, and then the reporter goes to the audience and says, here's what I know. Often in a voice goes, here's what I know. So you know that they know something. Uh, but that leaves out all the messy parts, the part where you don't know what's going on, the part where you get it wrong, the part where you argue with your editor about what it means, the part where you ask stupid questions, as has been mentioned. And we've decided to go the messy route. And what the show really is, is my partner, Jad, and I, we just inquire together, we get it wrong, we argue with each other, we go back to the scientists and say, how did you know that? Or why did you say it that way? Why didn't you say it this way? The elephant went across, and they go, and the, you can sometimes see the scientists go, oh, God. But I'll, I'll show you a short example of this. This is not from Radiolab. This is from a video I did recently for NPR. This was during a week when the bird flu was scaring everybody and the president had just declared a national emergency. And I just wanted to explore for our audience in a very basic way what a virus does. This is just simple virology. So I found a tape made by a pharmaceutical company, very expensive, gorgeous animation uh, with Denzel Washington, a major actor as the narrator, a studio orchestra, the Philadelphia Philharmonic was the, so it was very fancy. And I went to the company president and I said, can I take your video, get rid of Denzel Washington, get rid of the, uh, the music, 
get rid of your narrator, get rid of your script, and I want to just take the guy who made the video, who is a scientist, and sit him down in a chair and talk to him about what we see here. He said, well, why would I do that? I said, because your daughter would then understand this video. He had a seven-year-old daughter. He went, okay. <laughs> so I, I got permission, and what you'll see here, and I was very careful, you'll notice, not to use any terms from cell biology, so they're, even terms that are known to, to any middle schooler. So there are no organelles, there are no ribosomes, there's no transcription RNA. There's just very simple descriptive words like that yellow peanut thing, things like that. So let me, this is number, the flu on number four. Very short. So let's say that this guy has the flu, could be any flu, and here's a droplet from his sneeze containing, if we move in and take a really close look, you see, each one of those little purple things is a virus. And there are a lot of viruses floating through the air, some of which go inevitably up this unfortunate man's nose. How did that guy feel when you ripped off half of his face? It was interesting because we did it while he was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am talking with medical illustrator David Belinsky, who designed this video for Zyrus, a research company. So here comes the virus, and it's going to land on one of this guy's throat cells. So notice it's covered with little yellow knobby things. You, you call these keys, right? Those are the keys. Yeah, this is a key, this is a key, this is a key. Okay, if the keys on this virus happen to fit the locks, which are those little uh, purpley stick-uppy things on the surface of the cell, if there is a match... The cell, watch this, welcomes the virus in. And what's this? This is the welcoming committee. They all interlock with each other, and they pull this membrane down into the cell, and down it goes deeper and deeper, and that welcoming structure disperses, and the virus capsule bursts, and out comes the secret recipe for how to make more viruses in those little noodly things. So this unsuspecting cell has been tricked into guiding these virus recipes right into its own command center, the nucleus. So in they go. And they are immediately recognized by this big pink molecule, which is a mini factory. Yeah, what is it doing? It threads the nuclear material, the, the instruction code of the virus, through one hole, and out another hole comes a brand new instruction set. So it's a copying machine making copy after copy after copy of virus recipes, which then go out of the nucleus to little chefs, those blue peanutty things. They cook up proteins that go back into the nucleus where they are reassembled into baby viruses, and then out they go. They get covered up and head to the surface where they get new keys, and then boom! Here they come. This is an eruption of virus after virus after virus after only one virus entered the cell. But how many came out? Well, millions. Millions. So if one virus can produce a million babies and do it again and again and again, how come this guy doesn't just drop dead, I don't know, in like 10 minutes? Well, because you have about 100 trillion cells. I see. So a million viruses is just a drop in the bucket when you have a hundred trillion cells. And anyway, remember, you do have your own immune system, which when it sees a virus, usually kills it. So while the virus does multiply fast, with any luck, your immune system will work just a little faster. So yes, viruses, all viruses want to spread. That's what they do. But most of the time, we do keep them in check most of the time. So that's just very simple. Um, but what I really wanted to do, and all those sound effects, are, I just did them myself, see, yeah, is I wanted to demonstrate, whether you're a reporter or just a Joe or, or a Moshe or a Tsipora, to be local about it, uh, that you can talk to scientists as a curious person, even if you don't have the vocabulary, even if you don't have the learning. The questions themselves are good enough. And this comes from a political sense that we have, that citizens are not only allowed to inquire, they're supposed to inquire, and they're supposed to wonder out loud, and they're allowed to poke at the people who know more than they do, and lean in, and ask for questions so that they can understand. 
And it's important, and it's just as important for the scientists to learn how to answer ordinary questions and to talk in terms that laymen can understand. Now, that doesn't always mean that the scientist has to get it stupid or make it dumb or make it simpler than it is. Sometimes all that happens in these conversations is the scientists say to the layman, all right, I'm going to take you just this far, okay, just this far. That'll be enough for you and it'll be enough for me. And so they have a kind of gentleman's agreement. And the scientists we have on this show regularly, Brian Green, who's a physicist, V.S. Ramachandran, a neurologist, Stephen Strogatz, a mathematician, Oliver Sacks, another neurologist, uh, and the journalists we have, Jonah Lehrer, uh, Paul Hoffman here was once on our show, Carl Zimmer, Malcolm Gladwell. These are people who are extremely comfortable with language, with contesting, with explaining. So there's a spirit in the room that says, okay, we're going to get to a place where we can all say, oh, I see. That's our style. And in these conversations, and again, I'm going to show you some examples tomorrow, we push the scientists into corners that make some of you feel a little uncomfortable. Um, I was going to play you an example of what we did to one lady, uh, Cynthia Kenya, but I think I'm running a little over, so I'm going to jump over that. And I'll just ask, I'll finish with this question. Why would a scientist put herself in a situation like this. I mean, you have your very serious work, your meticulous, your elegant, your careful science, and then these people come, and in the example I was going to show you was just to, we turned this thing into a cartoon, but and it was done by us, so we don't even have science degrees. So the chances of these reporters getting your science wrong or embarrassing or casting you in a weird light, those chances are, are higher than zero. They're much higher than zero. So why do they do it? Why would Cynthia Kenyon or Ramachandran or Ed Wilson or Jim Watson, why do they come on shows like this? What's the benefit to them? I'm not sure, but I can guess. First of all, if we do it nicely, they look good. It's always nice. One can hope for that. Uh, of course, there's also the other possibility. Second, the story makes their work seem exciting or promising. That could lead to a grant renewal, maybe more money. That's always good. But I suspect there's another reason, and it's a deeper reason, which is that they know that science has to compete for attention and for money and for resources and for legitimacy with other groups in the culture. And some of those groups are not always friendly to science. And those groups have stories too. So yes, they're science stories, but they're also Bible stories and movie stories and folk tales and ghost stories and lots and lots and lots and lots of magical thinking, as you just heard. And when groups contend for resources, they use stories to make themselves look good. And in this marketplace of conflicting agendas, you've got to be in there telling your stories or you lose ground to stories like the tales of Dr. Frankenstein and Dr. Moreau and Dr. Evil, who are pretty great characters and really bad. So if scientists, on the other hand, can explain to you why the sky is blue or why things fall down and not up, and whatever happened to dinosaurs, people want to know that too. And telling those stories well keeps you, the scientist, valuable, and in the end gives you the freedom to keep doing what you do. So you go on the radio, and you go on TV, and you tell people, here's what I'm doing now in my lab, here's my thoughts, here's my experiment, here's my dream, here's my next challenge, and to some extent the exposure protects you. And I'm not saying that your stories will win everybody over, they won't. They never have. People are not rational about stories at all. I did an hour on ABC about string theory, and it got nine million viewers. And they stayed watching for the whole time, which because we have we measure these things. And I am assuming that they were at least intrigued with the possibility that the universe is composed of dancing strings of energy. Four minutes after my show was over, after the ads and after the next coming attractions. The next program up was about extraterrestrials landing in Montana and sexually examining cocktail waitresses. <laughs> and about two-thirds of the people who watched the String Theory show stayed on to watch the cocktail waitress show. And while I don't interview them or anything, I have a very strong suspicion that they liked the other one very well. You know, <laughs> Science journalism doesn't sweep magical thinking out of people's heads. But it does buy a kind of timeshare in their heads. And that's good. It's not the best thing, but it's good enough. You don't have to win the war, but you do always have to be in there battling for territory. So I suspect that one reason people come to us is they come to us because they know that freedom doesn't come for free. And you have to work for your living and for permission to make your living by getting grumpy like everybody else campaigning for your ideas. And in the end, of course, there's always this. This is science's trump card. That patterns in nature are simply beautiful. I mean, they just are. 
So to conclude, one time we did a, an hour about dying and what it means to be dead. When exactly are you dead? How dead is dead? Can you be dead for organ transplant but not dead enough for certain other organ transplant? What if someone looks dead but then turns out that in certain circumstances they're not dead at all? It was very grim stuff and so I asked one of our young reporters to go out and remind us what it's like to be alive to have moments that make you wonder and weep and stand in awe. You know, he, I paid him $450. He had to couch surf on his, uh, I mean sleep on his friend's couches. We used his uncle's camera and so on. But two and a half weeks later, he came back with this. And so we're going to go to the last one, which is the, the, the DVD uh, at the very back, which is called Moments. Um, and this is basically a, a celebration of, of wonder which is really what this is all about. So uh, whenever you can pop that in. Well, this is composed to an Icelandic band that we found. And I told this reporter, I said, just make sure that all the activity, in order for this to link well, keeps, keeps happening right on the vertical. So let's, you'll see what. The moment was, how would you define a moment? I, I, can't, I can't even say. I don't know. Ask me something simple. A moment in normal time. Normal time is this. What is a moment, though, honestly? It's that thing. It's, that's, it's beyond the senses. Mm. I don't know.